And good afternoon from Philadelphia. Frank here with uh, UFO News Network Sunday. We've got a big show with a huge lineup for everybody. Uh, we're going to review the year two, uh, 2019 as far as UFOs are concerned. So let's get to it. Uh, let me bring in my co-host, Chant Hanna. Uh, Chant, come on in and introduce our enormous panel uh, for today's show. Chant. Sorry about that, everybody. I got abducted for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have such a large panel on today. If I miss you, please go ahead and introduce yourself. That's literally how large our panel is today. So I'm going to go ahead and start off in no particular order. Uh, we have Michael W. Hall, so known as the Paranormal Lawyer. He has been involved in the UFO topic for many decades, and everybody looks to him for uh, UFO news and the latest, also from his UFO I team, they do in the field research. We also have Steve Hudgens, who's the director of investigations for uh, MUFON. We have uh, Jan Aldrich, and uh, Jan is the uh, founder and coordinator of Project 1947, a research project documenting UFO news accounts from sightings that occurred in 1947. Uh, we have Zen Benefil, he's an author, coach, educator, facilitator. Uh, with an MBA and MA in organizational management and curator for UFOlogy PRSS and blogger for UFOlogy Press. We have Shane Hurd, uh, investigator for Phoenix MUFON, Stacy Wright, assistant director of Phoenix MUFON and director of uh, Phoenix MUFON, Jim Mann with us. We also have Earl Gray, who, uh, was an investigator for many years for Southern California uh, MUFON, is now the assistant director for Southern California MUFON. I think there's maybe a few other positions uh, possibly with the star team. So, Earl, you'll have to update us on that. And then, uh, let's see, we have Ruben Uriate, who is an author and has uh, published uh, really interesting uh, findings regarding the UFO topic. So he'll have to share a little bit more about his background with us. And I'm trying to think if there's anybody else. I know we will probably have Paul Dean later on in the show. Steve Bassett uh, said he'll be joining us in a little bit. So that's it's correct. going to be a long show. So we got plenty of time to add those folks. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Scott, is uh, Dr. Scott on board? She is not, but uh, I've alerted her and hopefully she'll be joining us. Okay. We also have Michael Panicello the director for uh, Connecticut MUFON, who will be joining us. He just texted me to let me know that he's going to be doing that in a bit. We also have Russell Asbill, who is a uh, investigator for Phoenix MUFON. We have David Loomis. And David is also, uh, he's with MUFON, and I believe that he is the section director for Show Low MUFON. Is there anybody that I missed? Me. And who is me? Spiros. Spiros Malaris. Who is the creator and the director and owner of the Alien Autopsy movie and more. So we'll go over that later. Uh, so is there anyone else? That's pretty good. Okay. How is everybody doing today? That's great. Doing good. Great. <laughs> good to hear from nice. you. Nice. Now, when everybody comes on, um, and if you're on with us, please stay on audio because this is an audio only show. Do not go on video. We want to know uh, how do you feel the topic uh, went regarding the UFO, a topic that we all love to cover. Is there anything anybody would like to say about year 2019 regarding the UFO topic? Every ju everybody jump in at once. Yeah, right. Well, the tic-tac. This, and this, this sounds like Michael talking. Yes. It sounds like Michael Hall talking. Okay, that's breaking yeah. up. So well, this was has been. Okay, go oh. ahead. Hmm. Okay. 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 Go ahead, Russell. We're waiting. Oh, Okay. Yeah, uh, I didn't know if mine was when that was breaking up. One thing I noticed about 2019 is the general public is talking about it more. And I think that's because a lot of the uh, releases from the, the U.S. Navy has been going more mainstream. So people are accepting it better. And I think this would be a good time for the government to release more items. But, uh, 
anyway, it's uh, it's coming along. But in the public's eyes, they're becoming more acceptable. It's more in front of them. I think 2019 was a good year overall. Anybody else want to chime in on that topic? This is Earl from uh, Los Angeles MUFON. And, uh, yeah, 2019, it's as my friend Russell was just saying, I think that people have been much more open to hearing about the phenomenon. And, and I think that uh, your assessment is, is correct, too, Russell. A lot of it has to do with the uh, how the mainstream media has really focused on uh, the Nimitz affair, the Tic Tac uh, UFO. And, and it's kind of gone from there. It's, uh, you know, where... It seems like, you know, there's more news coverage and not as much of the X-Files theme and, and not as much joking about little green men and stuff like that. It's uh, it's kind of opened it up. And now you see people like Michio Kaku and, 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 and such coming forward uh, with with uh, good information and and not the usual ridicule that we're, uh, we, we've become so accustomed to in the past. And I'm glad you brought up Michio Kaku. I'd like to read a quote uh, that he was uh, uh, that was attributed to him this year when he went to, I think it was the third UFO World Congress in uh, Barcelona, Spain. He said the burden of proof has shifted to the government and the military. Now they have to prove that these sightings are not from outer space and another civilization. Several things have happened. First, we have videotapes, videotapes taken by United States Navy pilots that are testable. We can now see and calculate how fast they move, how fast they can zigzag, what is the altitude. We know the parameters of these objects now. We didn't have that before, and so this means that the burden of proof has shifted. Now the military, the government has to prove that they are not from another planet. Dr. Michio Kaku. Thoughts, anybody on this topic? Please let us know who it is uh, when you chime in. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Yeah, well, we have a big panel. Uh, did, uh, this is Ruben. Yeah, Ruben, go ahead. Ruben. Oh, hello, everybody. It's great to be okay. on the panel with, with such a great. One thing I've noticed is the increase in the whole topic of UFOs, but not necessarily just here in the United States. Sometimes I, I do um, get information and links from um, from other organizations throughout Mexico, Latin America and e even in Europe. So it just seems to be of course a uh, lot of it's an international phenomenon uh, and of course it has a lot of interesting um um you know people want to be updated and it's interesting to see uh, what people are following and they do follow the US media, they follow Mufon, they follow all all the other latest news, but also in particular, there's so much going on in other countries. So just wanted to point that, point that out. Just real That's one nice thing about this new world we're living in. Everybody can follow everybody. You know, if exactly. uh, something happens in England, uh, we can keep on top of that here in the States, no problem. It's fantastic. I, I would like to ask Stacy Wright and Jim Mann and David Loomis what they think of Mitch Yukaku's statements regarding uh, what he what he said this year at uh, the UFO Congress, the third uh, international UFO Congress in Spain. Well, this is Stacy, and um, I love what he said, but I think he kind of jumped on the bandwagon just because everyone else was about to jump on the bandwagon, too, and he didn't want to be left behind. So I do like what he said, and it kind of does give everyone the I told you so moment that we've been waiting for for quite a few years. Um, 2019 was a year of all kinds of action going on, and we finally had some stuff coming out that cannot be denied. So I think it was great. I'm glad Michio jumped on there like he did because he's very legitimate. People do listen to him. Okay. And uh, Jan Aldrich, I'd like to jump in and ask you, uh, uh, how do you think that 2019 went regarding UFOs? Uh, what was uh, uh, the big thing that got your attention, and uh, what do you see for us all going forward? Well, I, I have to agree with everybody else. The, uh, the, the press interest and uh, <clears throat> general public interest is, uh, is very... Uh, Stimulating, <clears throat> but we don't have what we usually have when we have uh, start 
uh, having discussions of uh, UFOs in the uh, mainstream media, we haven't had many people come forward uh, with old cases or current cases. It uh, seems like this is uh, uh, an unusual uh it is odd. You're right about that. Uh, we've seen uh, from uh, uh, the To the Stars folks, uh, we've seen more detail on a couple of big cases. Uh, the Nimitz case, which is uh, uh, you know going on 16 years old now, and then the more recent case involving the Roosevelt. Uh, you know, people are uh, kind of jumping on the boat, basically, as uh, uh, from uh, that Nimitz case. Uh, uh, Dave Beatty's done an amazing job in terms of uh, rounding up uh, uh, new witnesses who were uh, available for that. But it, it seems like uh, that's all we've got. There have to be more cases than that. Yes. Shane here. Uh, this is Jan again. I, I, uh, I'm looking at this statement, too, that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the government has to prove. Uh, we, had, uh, we had information before Nimitz, if you look at the uh, Minard case in 68, we had uh, uh, we had the uh, radar uh, photographs, and and they. Uh, uh, I just I just want to uh, remember uh, taking those down to uh, 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 Dr. Haynes and him looking at him, and he knew immediately what was going on in the photographs. He could figure out the speeds right away. So we've had we've had information. It just is not breaking through like the Nimitz case did. Now, uh, with that, why not? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Shane, uh, one, uh, I do want to follow up with Jan, then we'll get to you. Uh, uh, Jan, uh, yeah, yeah. what was the time frame for uh, you and uh, uh, Dr. Haynes uh, taking a look at that radar information? How long after the the case itself did you guys get hold of that? Uh, well, uh, uh, this is a uh, we could go on with this thing for it's a it's a it's a lesson in UFO history and in, and how to do everything wrong in UFOs. But uh, Tom Tom and I uh, Tom Tomin and I uh, interviewed uh, the pilot. Uh, about 2004, I think it was, and we started getting a hint about how big this case was, even though it was in Blue Book, you could read that, but uh, once we started talking to all the, uh, all the uh, participants, it was, uh, it was fantastic. And then the radar, the radar photographs, which were which are in blue book but they're very poor but we got a really good uh set of photographs from uh, the former intelligence officer up there and uh well I I could say another one uh at the uh Air and Space Museum in New Mexico uh uh Lieutenant Colonel Matson we showed him those radar things and he understood what was going on right away it was it, it, so the the problem is the press. We got uh, the Nimitz case got in the press, and it's uh, got a lot of traction, which uh, we didn't have before. And uh, Minot is kind of very complicated uh, uh, type of uh, story that that uh, may be difficult to understand. We know the skeptics don't want to go near it. They're scared of it. Okay, and uh, Shane, you were looking to jump in. What do you got? Yeah, I was thinking about Dr. Kaku and his, his comment, and I kind of asked myself, well, why does he think now that the burden of proof lies on the government? And, you know, what I was thinking about was the fact that it's really the quality of evidence that has been presented, namely those three gun camera video clips that, to my knowledge, we've never had that kind of data before. Actual U.S. military airplanes recording with, you know, optical and thermal uh, camera data. And, and um, you know, it makes it 
hard to refute, hard hard to dismiss. So um, I think in that way, it's pretty powerful stuff. And so, and the way that it's played out with TTSA releasing the videos, a lot of the mainstream media coverage, then, you know, the production of Unidentified America's UFO Investigation, um, and then subsequently the Navy releasing, you know, the fact that, yeah, UFOs are real, we're engaging them, and we're changing our reporting procedures so, you know, our military members can quickly and easily and without retribution make a report. I mean, to me, that's just almost the the biggest thing that's happened in 70 years of ufology. And, you know, we're all here to see it. So I think it's really awesome. And I do appreciate Dr. Kaku weighing in because he is a, a credible individual. Um, although he is a mainstream scientist, so he still has other views. He's not all in a, on the reality of UFOs being aliens, but he's at least dipping his toe in that water, which, we, again, we have never seen in the past. So I think it's a pretty big deal. 2019 is awesome. Uh, David Loomis, uh, the state section director for Sholo MUFON. And then I'd also like to ask Jim Mann the same question. What are your thoughts on what Michu uh, Kaku said? That the quote that I read, and also his perspectives regarding the UFO topic. Hello, hello. You Do might you have, have to unmute your mic. Yeah, you your might have to unmute your mics. David Loomis and Jim Mann. Hi, this is Jim. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, you're oh, yes. fine. You sound good. Yeah. You know, I have to go along with the comment that Stacy made that I think a lot of people are almost to the point of, of uh, because their, their, their visibility is so high, like Michio and others, and I know there's others and I don't pay attention to them. Um, I think sometimes I think they're forced into it. They have to say something because the world is watching them and they're expecting them to say something. The logical thing at this point after all the evidence that have come forward this past year, 2019, um, you have to say something if you are a person of high visibility. So I think, um, I think um, Dr. Uh, Kaku uh, came forward because of that. And although, I mean, I think he has a genuine interest in, in the fact that uh, we're not alone in the universe. I, I think he's made that very clear, but he was pretty much cornered by uh, by uh, news media and uh, research communities in general. We were all waiting to see what he was going to say. If Stephen Hawkins were still around, we'd be waiting to see what Stephen has to say, and he would be cornered too, and he would have to say something, and that's kind of the way I feel about it. And, you know, going forward at this point, this is what's going to happen with, with every uh, person of, of notoriety who is in science and astronomy and research, uh, you know, the space programs, NASA and the rest, they're going to have to say something eventually because they're going to look like the fool. And I think the, the fact that the burden of proof now is no longer on, on uh, the MUFON groups and other UFO uh, independent research groups, proof is out there. And, and now we're just waiting for others to... Uh, to make comments. And I think that's a great, great spot to be in. Uh, and I think that's what we've seen uh, here in 2019 is that we can finally rest a little bit and, and set back and see what the rest of the world's going to finally admit. I think that's pretty neat. So we, we still have Dave Loomis to hear from Zen Beneful, Michael Hall and Spiros Millaris. And also just so everybody knows we have another individual who came on the show with us. His name is Dean Ashley, and uh, he actually uh, ha joined the Navy in 1996, became an aviation electronics technician, and served for a little over four years. And he is an expert on a variety of FLIRs, both old and new, analog and digital, just so uh, everybody is aware of his background. Uh, Dave Loomis, if you're there, can you please uh, chime in on this topic? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah, can hear you. We can, we can barely hear you. I'm, I'm having some issues up here. Yeah, you're mu you're muffled. When you feel like you're able to fix that muffled uh, aspect, let us know. And I'm going to go ahead and move on to Zen Beneful. What is your uh, perspective regarding Michio Kaku on this topic? 
Well, I, I'm kind of in agreement with Stacy and Jim and, and that he needed to stand up and say something. The fact that he took it um, even deeper into the possibilities of the type two, type three civilizations, what they're capable of, you know, and looking at it um, from a broader perspective of, you know, thinking of how would they engage us or how might we be able to perceive how they're engaging us, which to date we haven't really been able to do so uh, because we've been focused on the nuts and bolts and the sightings and the videos and, and the evidence and things of that nature, which the hard data is just as important as the soft side, which is the experience of it. Um, in 20, uh, I guess this didn't happen in 2019, but in 2018, um, free released their series of surveys and the results, uh, however speculative or even um, uh, more of a subjective kind of, of look at things. I think that will in the f near future hold as high as importance as the physical data uh, because we've got to eventually, okay, who are we dealing with? How are we dealing with them? How do we interact? Can we interact? Uh, how do they want us to interact? What are they here to offer? Or are we just being observed? Are these folks from our ancient past or from our present or the future? Or, you know, there's lots of questions that are still unanswered and, and maybe not even asked. I think one of the things that, uh, to me, and, and I could be totally wrong, but the meta materials that came up the TTSA are going to be released, and Linda brought those out in their mid-90s. Um, part of what it seems, especially from the location that they were found, which was in the northern White Sands area, not too far from the Trinity site. So, you know, we, we need to, the questions that we ask. My statement about that is in regards to the nuclear tests and the possible uh, fusion of materials that then appear to be metamaterials. Okay, um, okay. so I'm going to move on to, because we have quite a few people. We have Steve Hudgens, Michael Hall, Dean Ashley, Earl Gray, um, Ruben Uriate. Uh, you know, there's few people left. Any one of the people I just mentioned, please chime in, uh, but let us know who you are. And please put your other mics on, on uh, mute. Thank you. So we have Earl. Uh, we have uh, Steve Hudgens, uh, Dean Ashley. Any, any one of you folks, Ruben Uriate, who would like to come forward? Steve? I will. Steve Hudgens. Okay, thank you. I agree with what Jim and Oliver, everyone is saying. And uh, I believe that when uh, he said that the burden of proof is on the Navy, that takes the shoulder, the two before, off of everyone's shoulder and puts it onto the Navy. And we all know the Navy and the government, they're not going to admit to anything at this moment. Okay. All right, great. Thank you very much for that. And then uh, Earl Gray, we have you. Um, hi. hi. Yeah, uh, this is Earl. I, uh, You know, what's interesting, I think, is that uh, we've talked about this before, even on your show, that, that Dr. Bruce Maccabee uh, has been talking a lot recently about how none of this is new information, the speeds of the craft, uh, the way that uh, the craft that were, you know, reported in the Nimitz affair, uh, you know, how they should have created a fireball, didn't, they should have, you know, been causing sonic booms, which didn't happen. But, uh, you know, this is sort of old news, old hat to the bunch of us, you know, have been studying, UF, you know, ufology for many years. I mean, reports like this go back to 1947. Uh, so something has definitely changed as far as I think uh, absolutely that the New York Times, that, that they published that story, that that was quite a wonderful reveal for it. And you do have to take, you know, love them or hate them. You have to take hats off to, to the Stars Academy guys. You know, they did get this information out in a, a huge publicity, you know, thrust out to the media. So uh, it, it really does put us in a different position now. And uh, Michio, I think, is probably the first of, of many scientists that are probably going to eventually have to, as you were saying earlier, are going to have to address the situation. I mean, it's worldwide. People are seeing craft as they always have. 
Another thing that's really interesting is how many people in the UFO field have been coming forward lately as experiencers. Uh, you know, I work in the experiencer research team with Kathleen Mart and, uh, you know, over in MUFON. And uh, I speak with experiencers uh, sometimes every day, multiple people. And we, we see the same markers in people, the same, uh, this, the same story. But uh, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a lot of authors, a lot of speakers, and a lot of big names in ufology have recently been coming out and saying, uh, I'm an experiencer too. Uh, so that's something. Uh, this is something new that people are feeling comfortable in sharing their own personal visitations, from okay. Kathleen Martin mm -hmm. to uh, you know to uh, I mean there have been a lot of people that have been coming forward. Uh, Richard Hastings I think just came forward. Uh, Robert Solis, uh, myself. <laughs> I mean, a lot of us have been finally coming forward and feeling comfortable talking about it. So it's kind of opened up the floodgates, I think, to uh, the phenomenon. Great. Thank you. Uh, we also have Ruben Uriate, Spiris Milaris, and Dean Ashley, uh, and maybe one other person left to talk about this topic. So Ruben or Spiros or Dean, uh, whichever one of you want to speak up, uh, and Michael Hall also, just be sure to say your name uh, so we know who's talking. This is uh, Spiros here. Okay. Hiya. Um, good, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Depending <laughs> where you are. Good evening. Uh, um, I don't really have much to say. I'm not really from a UFO <laughs> community, so I, I, I don't really follow all the stuff. I, I, come from, I, I think I have a unique perspective from everybody else, which is, that of a lay person looking in. And um, my question to you, I mean, I, 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 I'll let you carry on with this, this subject, but my question ultimately will be, um, are you doing enough to make the subject that you're um, investigating and studying credible? Um, because from, from the outside looking in, it, it is a bit of a circus. And we've seen a lot of, in, in 20, here, here. 2019... We've seen an awful lot of nonsense spoken, and a lot of you have backed it up. <laughs> uh, so, so we'll talk about that later. But, but for the time being, I've got nothing else to say apart from, you know, um, let me know when you want me. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I want to ask you about this. You had a really interesting year involving the UFOs. Uh, a little video known as the Alien Autopsy video uh, got yeah. back into the news. Uh, uh, you had some role in uh, producing that. So uh, here it all is coming kind of full circle for you. Uh, a lot of attention again uh, uh, focused on that particular piece of work. And uh, now all of a sudden... Uh, it seems like uh, you can't kill it. It seems like uh, it uh, was pretty well put to bed and uh, explained as a, you know, uh, as a as a hoax, as a fiction uh, uh, designed to entertain people. And uh, ultimately, it's back in. And uh, some folks are uh, running around in the UFO field saying, uh, "No, actually, uh, uh, despite the fact that the guys who made it are saying it's a fake, uh, we think it's real." So uh, also, what, uh, what's uh, going on there? Let's mention the 25 year anniversary of it next year. It's really important. Yes, that yes. We do. Okay, please. My good, friend, Go my good friend, Philip Mantle, who I respect highly in this field um, because he's meticulous in his research. You know, he doesn't leave any, t any stone unturned. And, um, and he researched the alien autopsy for the, the majority of that 25 years. And, and um, uh, so he said to me a few years ago, the alien autopsy is never going to go away. It's never going to die. And I said, Philip, no one's interested anymore. Why would they be? And he was absolutely right, of course. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the big question I have, um, is Mr. Hall here with us? Yes, yes, Michael Hall is here with us. Hello, Michael. Um, uh, how are you? Hey, uh, Spiros, I'm doing well, buddy. Excellent. Well done. Um, I, I've got a question for you. Yes. Um, on your show, you you spoke to Ray Santilli, and and Mrs. Santilli made a number of promises to you that he would deliver film and he would deliver evidence and and and, and all sorts of wonderful um, things, and and he's delivered nothing. Um, and I and I've asked you a few times at which point are we going to say uh, he hasn't got anything. At what point do you shut this down? Because you've left it open that that 
it, he, you've left it open in the public domain that, that he's going to deliver real film. Well, you know, uh, Grant Cameron and I, that was our uh, main intent was to uh, put him on the record. Yes. And of course, uh, he uh, he does come on the record, you know, and he says that he has some original film. Yeah. Uh, maybe a minute and eight seconds worth of original film uh, yeah. that was uh, melded into your production, is what he said, of course, yeah. during our interview. Uh, and that uh, he would be willing to, at one point, he says, share that original film so we could verify its authenticity, uh, you know, with the experts uh, out there. And, of course, uh, we have not received that film. So uh, it's not going to be up to Grant Cameron or myself to shut it down. We are just basically making sure that people realize that the statement was made. The longer the period of time goes without him proving his statement with uh, backing up with the evidence is, uh, you know, that's in his ball court there. So uh, I, I, I still would love to see him do something in that regard, because uh, I even understand that uh, Philip Mantle has some original uh, frames of that film himself uh, that no. he might be willing to uh, to bring no, forward. That's, well. Yeah, that's not true. That's not true. Um, what Philip has got is some 1947 film of a random occurrence that has nothing to do with the alien autopsy, aliens, or anything extraordinary. And um, it's just a piece of film from the era. Okay. And, uh, well, okay. Even, even that would be very helpful as far as trying to get a base, uh, you know, knowledge of that era film for sure. I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is that we're out there still waiting to find any corroborative evidence that would uh, show that... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, this thing is true true or false. I'm, I'm not uh, coming down on either side of the thing, and I'm just waiting at this point. And the longer we wait, to find, the longer it's going to uh, you know, be lingering in people's minds. I, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate your position, but my, my position is, and I don't know if you're aware, but um, I, I made a challenge to Mrs. Santilli uh, with a, a, a national newspaper in the U.K., that we would take a lie detector test together and um, once and for all, um, Mrs. Santilli said, absolutely no problem, we'll do that. It's on my, it's on my website if anybody wants to go and see the, the, the clips that are there. Um, and he didn't turn up, okay? The other thing that, that, I mean, this is a long time ago now. So my point to you is, do you not have a responsibility? And please don't think I'm having a go at you because I know I know you're being fair and you're you're being impartial. But do you not think that you have a responsibility to put some pressure onto Santilli? Because all that's happened is he's made a rash promise. He's on record as saying he has film. Those that believe him are saying, yeah, you are, you see, he's got film. And what you're doing is you're just letting him be on record, having said he's got film. It's time to put up or shut up. He can't. He can't have it both ways. And if you say, "Well, we, we know," we, we, hopefully he'll come forward. Well, he hasn't come forward in a long time. How long is it since the show? It must be a few months now. So, so at what point do we say he's never going to deliver any film? So he's never had any film. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, as a matter of fact, that he has never had any film. Okay. I made the Alien Autopsy film completely from scratch. So there's no elements in that film which are from a real film. So I know that for a fact. And I've actually asked Mrs. Santilli, please show me which frames are the real ones. Because I edited that whole thing up, so I am not aware of any other frames. And I said, if there are real frames, somebody else must have put them in. So let's talk to that person. Nothing happens, of course. He just goes quiet. And then he'll materialize. He'll come forward when somebody like Grant Cameron makes some very, very bold statements. Um, and then there's airtime and it looks like there's another buck to be made. So they come forward and they start making promises again. And what I'm what I'm actually saying is um, you've afforded him airtime to continually perpetuate this lie. And at some point you must take responsibility and say, We've given him enough time. Let's give him a deadline. 
let's say, Mr. Santilli, we've had a few months now. Should we call it another three months? How much do you need? How much time do you need? And let's call it, let's give it a deadline so it's not another 25 years. You see, because at this rate, it will be another 25 years and he'll still be going on about this film that he's got that no one's ever seen. Well, uh, Spyro, so let me just yeah. uh, respond real quickly here is that uh, indeed uh, what you're doing today is yeah. uh, kind of uh, throwing the gauntlet down over and over at this guy when in reality, uh, you know, my thought is uh, let him allow uh, a, a specific time frame to say something. And then if he doesn't produce, you let the public make up their mind on whether this is a true story or not. But to bring him up every every uh, once in a while and say, hey, where is the stuff? Where is the stuff? That's counterproductive as far as I'm concerned, because if he's not going to come forward, that's up to him. And we're going to let it die. But uh, if you want to make sure it dies, don't keep bringing him up. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I can't agree with that because the the fact that you don't put it to bed and close it, it stays alive. And you're, you're, asking, you're asking me to prove you're asking me to prove a negative, which is impossible to do. You can't do it either. So what we're doing at this point is just asking for evidence. If it doesn't come forth, uh, then uh, the the court of public opinion is going to make up their own uh, decision in that regard. If we were to talk about a court case, um, if you didn't produce evidence in that court case then you would be found guilty if you don't find that evidence. And, and it will be thrown out. It wouldn't be left there. Oh, well, we can't decide. We'll just leave it. The judge would say there is no evidence. There's no smoking gun. There's no dead body. There's no DNA. There's nothing. There is no case. There's no, there's no murder. Um, it's a simple case of he has produced no evidence whatsoever in 25 years. And that's yeah. that. And, and, and as experts in the field investigating a subject, a subject, you have a responsibility to close it down, not leave it open. Because if you leave it open, it leaves him in business. Well, you're you're a little mistaken there when you say the judge is going to close the case, you know, with no evidence. Basically, the evidence or not is going to be presented. And of course, then the jury is going to make up the decision on uh, truth or veracity of this uh, event. And I, I don't even want to keep going on this subject. We've got a whole lot of experts on our panel today that uh, need to get their points of view out on many, many other subjects. Absolutely. But I agree. I, I can, agree. All should I can we, say we, is that let's just allow the public to be the jury in this regard, and they're going to make up their own minds very quickly. Um, okay. Well, they have. Go ahead. 50%, 50 think it's real. <laughs> okay. So that's where we are. Everybody that's listening, how many of you think the alien autopsy film is real? Just out of interest. Nope. Not here. <laughs> I don't think any. Anybody, nobody's chiming in there. Yeah. So no. no. All right. <laughs> so thank you very much for that input from uh, Spyrus Millar, the director and owner and creator of the alien autopsy movie, and also from Michael W. Hall. Uh, uh, attorney. So I uh, would like to ask Dean Ashley about the topic of Michio Kaku and uh, what he said. I'm going to read to you the quote just so you know what he said uh, at the uh, third annual UFO Congress in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Uh, what he said was this, the burden of proof has shifted to the government and the military. Now they have to prove that these sightings are not from outer space and another civilization. Several things have happened. First, we have videotapes. Videotapes have taken uh, videotapes taken by United States Navy pilots that are testable. We can now see and calculate how fast they move, how fast they can zigzag, what is the altitude. We know the parameters of these objects now. We didn't have that before, and so this means that the burden of proof has shifted. Now the military, the government, has to prove that they are not from another planet. The question I have for you, Dean, is this. Michu Kaku has put, uh, uh, from his perspective, first world governments or the U.S. government in the position of having to have the burden of proof regarding the UFO UAP topic. What is your thought process on that? Hey, Jan, how are you doing? Can you hear me? I, yep, yes. You're loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with who Michu is, and uh, I read his quote a while ago. 
it's um, I'm kind of concerned is uh, is the Navy going to take on that position um, and can they? Because from what I'm just seeing as a, an observer is um, I don't think they're too familiar with what it is and I don't know exactly how much they can do. Um, as far as the videos being released, you know, that's a big step. And um, I've talked to engineers and technicians in the field and amongst um, the, the majority of us, we can't determine what it is, how it's moving like that. Um, but, you know, we're not experts on aircraft movement and, you know, just we see what we see. It is what it is. Um, but none of us can really just, ju just classify what, what these things are. So I'm not sure how much the, the Navy can do. Very good insight. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, now, I wanted to mention something. By the way, Dave Loomis, is he still on with us? I don't know if he's there, but if he is, I just want to hear how his audio is. Mm, no, okay. Best to, yeah, right. best to move on. I, I, I do have a topic to move on. It's very important. President Donald Trump. Uh, doesn't appear to be a believer of aliens or UFOs flying through the Earth's atmosphere. I'm reading a USA Today article, by the way, just so you know, although he has been briefed on them. ABC's News, George Stephanopoulos, in a wide-ranging interview, asked Trump about recent news reports about Navy pilots spotting flying objects and what he made of the apparent UFO sightings. This is a, a quote uh, attributed to Trump during that interview. I want them to think whatever they think, Trump said. Uh, raising his eyebrows and slightly grinning before adding that he did not really, uh, that he had one really brief meeting on it. People are saying wow. they're seeing UFOs. Do I believe it? Not particularly, he added. Now, I do have a disclaimer to share with our panelists. I would very much appreciate no jokes about the president. This is not <laughs> a topic to joke around about the president. We do not want that on this show. We would like folks to please chime in on what they feel about Trump uh, talking about the UFO topic and anything related to that topic. I'd like to ask Jim Mann to please start off with that because I interviewed Stacy Wright and Jim Mann on this topic and uh, they had some really interesting things to say. Jim or Stacy? Hi, this is Jim. Um, yeah, as far as the president, what is the president going to say? You think about the responsibility that is on his shoulders, and we're Hello. talking about... Yep. Yeah, I, yes. I just added uh, Paul Vecchiette. Okay. So. All right, great. Thank you. Hold okay, on, Sorry please. about that. Go. Uh, keep going, Jim. Sorry. Sorry Jim, for the I'm interrupt. Jim, I'm very sorry. Please keep talking. I'm just thinking about, it doesn't make any difference if this is President Trump or some other president. Uh, the responsible thing for a president to do at this point uh, is he going to go on TV and national TV and admit that there's uh, technology out there that we can't deal with, that we don't know how to deal with it, and we don't know what it is? Would that be a responsible thing for any president to admit uh, to the world? No, no, that would not be the responsible thing. So uh, I don't think we need to look at the president of the United States uh, what, in terms of what is his opinion, Okay. He's going to give you some, uh, regardless of who is, and we all know this, he's going to give you some really slacker opinion. He, he just can't give you an honest opinion. Um, the people that we need to look to, again, are the science leaders of the country. And um, so as far as, as from a political standpoint, look, we all know the United States right now is, a, is in a uh, – <laughs> You guys, I don't even know if there's words for what's going on right now. Um, but uh, regardless of what your political views are, um, we, we have to stay focused on our mission, and that is the, uh, the scientific study of the UFO phenomena, and we keep focused, okay? So people like Donald Trump or, uh, you know, whoever, Nancy Pelosi or whoever it might be, Okay, that's not a part of who we are right now. So that's kind of the way I look at it, guys. Whatever, whatever, the, whatever we hear on the on, on the news in terms of a political opinion, um, I don't really care right now. I'm I'm looking for a scientific opinion. I'm looking for 
sort of where the military stands on this. Okay. Not necessarily Washington that, stands on it. Thank you so much for your valuable input. And Stacy, uh, we talked about this. Could you please share uh, your perspective regarding uh, uh, the topic of Trump and UFOs and uh, along those lines regard when that news came out and how important it was? Well, I was really disappointed when I watched him on TV with the smirk and the nonchalance that he uh, showed toward the topic. Um, I think we're all going, oh, yeah, right. I mean, we all know better. We know that he has been briefed on this stuff. We know that he knows more than he's ever going to say. And like Jim said, any president out there, they're not going to say much. They just can't because then that would put them in a situation or a predicament where they have to back it up. And they can't back it up with facts because things are classified. So you can only go so far as president, which is really sad sounding, but I think it is the reality of this. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to have to try to find our answers elsewhere. It's not going to come from the president's lips. Okay, I'm still asking for Dave Loomis to see if he's out there to talk with us. If he is, please interrupt at any time and just let us know you're there. That way we can ask you about this topic. Uh, wanted to ask if any one of our panelists wants to jump in and talk about this Trump slash UFO topic. When this news came out, how did you feel about it? What was your gut feeling on it? And what are your perspectives to share on it? Anyone? This is Earl. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody, you know, I, I was watching Ancient Aliens the other night, I confess. You know, <laughs> it's not always the best. We will hold it against you, Earl, don't worry. But uh, they had Tucker Carlson on, and uh, they were talking with Tucker about this very subject. And Tucker, who usually will pretty much back anything that the president will say, uh, Tucker's opinion was, was, well, you know, watch his body language. His body language isn't really going along with what his mouth is saying. You know, he was kind of hemming and hawing around it. And you could tell that he didn't want to be even addressing the subject. And Tucker said that he felt like he was uh, he was be not being forthcoming about the actual information. Uh, you know, you look at other presidents. Yeah, who, just to jump in, Earl, uh, uh, as well as Stephanopoulos, uh, Tucker Carlson did ask the president about the UFO situation as well. Yeah, so he did yeah. ask him directly in an interview. Yeah, Tucker didn't think he was being forthcoming yeah, about what he knew. Uh, you know, I mean, people like uh, we, we know that uh, Bill Clinton had an interest in the subject and he claimed that they never gave him the information, which I think is questionable. Uh, you know, Ford had an interest in the phenomena as well, and, and he never came forward with the information. Uh, Ronald Reagan. I mean, there were a lot of presidents that, you know, Reagan may have been the most forthcoming of all. Uh, with his speech in front of the United Nations, where he talked about how, you know, if, if uh, there was an outside threat, you know, humans would drop their acrimony towards each other really quickly. And, and uh, but maybe it's something that the president is just told, you know, you, you can't, you simply can't bring this up. It's just too thorny of a, a, a situation. You know, I mean, what's he going to say? You know, uh, abductions are real, you know. I mean, we don't know what, you know, it may, it, there's stuff in there that could really scare people. So maybe this drip, drip sort of disclosure is the best we're going to get. Earl? Great. And uh, I'd like to hear from Shane and also Steve Hudgens. Uh, Shane here. Yeah. I, you know, I agree that the president is not the person that we're likely going to hear this from because of the, you know, politically complicated um, nature of that that question, but um, I think Jim was mentioning earlier as we, you know, making overtures, um, we see scientists such as as Michio Kaku, and now mainstream media um, treating the subject with, you know, a certain degree of credibility, and I think that's what that's the most impactful because in the end whose opinion really matters to all these groups, whether it's politicians, media, the military, is what do the people think? What do we, the people, think about the matter? And so this is why they're very 
cagey with the information is because of the potential impact on the people and how we might react. So, and, and, and I understand, you know, the whole Battelle Institute thing and thinking chaos might ensue and all these things, but I think we're probably, um, you know, in a period of time where that's not going to happen, we're, we're just completely saturated with information 24 seven and it's bound to come out and it's bound to happen. But I think people are going to be able to handle it. But like I said, I think, you know, looking for the president to come out and say it's just not a reality, but these other avenues um, that should leak out, drip out. And then when it becomes safe enough for those people to come out and confirm, um, you know, I think that will happen. Great. And uh, Steve Hudgens, if you're there, please uh, let us know what you think regarding this topic. Uh, you're not going to hear anything coming from the president until he just has to. Their own uh, uh they're bound by security not to say anything about it, but that that have to ask yourself, uh, uh, what's the problem with it? Is it from outer space or is it just a security about what we have in the United States that might be the UFOs surrounding the world looking at everything? Uh, most sighting reports are coming from the United States and a few select countries over in uh, Europe. So uh, I, 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 I'm still not convinced that all of these UFOs are from outer space. That's just the way I look at it. Okay. Are, are you convinced that any of them are, uh, Steve? I would think that I look at it this way. Here you have a uh, superior race because they had to be superior to get here, and the vast distances and uh, the whatever there's like like say okay, here I am a million years in the future, and I go to this backward planet of apes, and I have my only way of getting back home, and I fly over these Planet of the Apes with their guns and their missiles and their jet planes, and they could damage my vehicle before I can't get home. No, I'm going to be invisible. That's what I'm going to be. That's about all I can say about it. Green. And anyone else want to jump in here? Paul, well, Vicky, you've joined us. Uh, what, what do you have to say about all this? Well, Hello, Paul. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I guess I'm on another plane with the rest of the folks. Uh, I, I understand disclosure. It's a, it's a noble cause. And there's an idealism about disclosure where we feel that once there's disclosure, then there's probably a possibility of a transfer of technology and improvement of our society. And I feel that um, that's, that's really not going to happen. And, and um, the main reason is because what we are is humans. There are flaws that we have. We are uh, inherently violent. We are uh, spiritually corrupt, materialistic, and worst of all, Throughout history, we have exhibited penchant for being genocidal. So the hypothesis should be that if we were to gain their technology in some way through a treaty or something like that, we would eventually use that technology and weaponize it and use it against them. And our materialism would take over in the name of manifest destiny. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, and Steve, uh, uh, Steve Bassett has joined us. So, uh, Steve, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Hello, Steve. I think he's cutting up a little bit uh, for some reason. Uh, Steve, unmute your mic. There. Yeah, left. it's okay. okay. I can I can grab him again. Right, you want to grab him? Okay. Uh, what is your What is your thought process on what we're talking about here? Well, first of all, I, I do believe the public in general is still really constricted by perceptions of threat. And I think that's really where our government and the military, that's the same stance that they take because they're there for our protection. And ultimately they have to look at anything that could be perceived as a threat, no matter how trite it might appear. And so in order to you know, go beyond that and to release anything and talk about it openly, they're risking mass hysteria. And the public, I believe, is still in that, 
<laughs> state of mind, so to speak. We haven't learned to just look, observe, inquire, and not feel threatened by the unknown. You know, the for ages through, you know, all kinds of different, um, not just spiritual or religious uh, the industries are, you know, we have this penchant for seeing the worst first and then assuming that is so. And part of what's taking place, I believe, is the movement away from that where it's becoming a topic of discussion. People are being more open about it. A lot of the experiences are now coming forward. I mean, I've been doing this for over 30 years and, and was, felt like an outlier and still do because of that. Um, but that's okay because that's the nature of the business we're in, right? We're pushing the envelope. We're asking questions. We're sharing experiences. We may not be able to explain exactly what those experiences are, but yet we're doing our best to articulate our perceptions of them and then attempt to be uh, at least be open for inquiry and trying to take a, a more of an objective observational view of the possibilities and and expand in that nature, which I think is also happening as far as the the data and, and how we're looking at that and maybe the perception of how Maybe the military and our government's looking at it behind the scenes, but they're unable to speak to us about it just <laughs> because of the nature of the beast, right? They're, it's just almost impossible for them to do so and still hold the credibility of the office. Okay, we have a researcher uh, and historian, Paul Dean, on with us. Paul Dean, welcome to the show. We've been talking about a few topics. One was the uh, input issue. Proof is now on the U.S. government to provide more information on that topic. And we're also talking about how Trump uh, gave some input regarding the UFO topic. If you want to talk about either one of those topics, that would be great. Paul, are you there? Can you hear me? You might want to unmute your mic if you heard me. Okay, can you hear me or not? Yep, yeah, you sound great. Thanks, okay, Paul. Okay. okay, so I reckon both were probably off-the-cuff comments. you got to remember, someone like Michelle Kaku is, is just constantly physically speaking, like just constantly physically talking, like opening up wings of universities and visiting, uh, having dog and pony shows at, um, at observatories and, and, and whatever else. And like, it's very, very easy for someone to say something that lasts for four seconds and, and bunnies like us take it as, um, as uh, being, you know, just somewhat critical importance. Um, I, I mean, it was a good, it was a really good statement and, you know, like he's on the right track, but, you know, we shouldn't, I wouldn't be giggling like schoolgirls being asked out to the prom over it. Um, you know, it's just, I mean, well, it's true, you know, like it's pathetic. It, it's, it's, it's the, as for Donald Trump's comments, it, it, again, completely irrelevant. Um, what he actually said was, it was, 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 was in, in dissent in that he said, he said, do I believe, he was talking about, um, UFO witnesses, and he said, "Do I believe them? Not particularly. Okay, do I believe them? Not particularly. Okay, so that's that's um, again a four-second comment, completely irrelevant." Okay, we have Steve Bassett who's who has joined us a few times. He's had a few audio issues, but we're going to see if he's doing okay now. And uh, Paul, thank you very much for the input on that. And Steve, uh, what we were asking about were two topics during the show. One was the uh, Kaku had on the UFO topic and how the burden of proof lies with the U.S. government regarding that topic. And then also uh, the topic of Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, when he gave uh, a few quotes regarding the UFO topic and he was uh, on the news this year regarding the UFO topic. Do you have any input to give on those two topics? I don't know if you can hear me, Steve, but if your yeah. mic's on mute, you might want to unmute it. Yeah, I'm not getting any audio from him, but we will go ahead and try from him in yeah, just he a is, few minutes. Yeah, uh, he is not on the call, so that's the issue there. Yeah, so Steve, you're on with us. You just asked. You are actually on on the 
call with us right now with our panel of guests. If you can, unmute your mic and stay on audio, not video. And uh, when you come through, just let us know. Uh, Frank, were there any other topics that you wanted to bring up about the news this year? Well, I th- what I thought was uh, kind of interesting is, as we've seen this pattern over the last couple of years, uh, the first half of the year tends to get a little busier, and then the second half slows up. There hasn't been a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, big news coming down the pike really since the Unidentified show went off the air. And I was uh, wondering if uh, anybody has uh, any thoughts. You think uh, there's like a uh, uh, an off season now for uh, UFO stuff, and uh, we kind of scramble to uh, get some shows done and uh, cover some hot topics uh, uh, during some part of the year, and then another part of the year we can barely keep up. Uh, it seems like uh, the last two years things have slowed noticeably during the last half of the year. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, Jan Aldrich, could I? Uh, jump yeah, in absolutely, here? Jan. Go ahead. Okay, uh, as far as uh, news, as recent news, um, Chris Rakowski is sending his material to uh, the University of El- uh, Man- Manitoba. Um, now, what he is, what he is the the point of contact for uh, official UFOs in Canada. So the Canadian government sends him all, uh, well, the Canadian government sends him uh, UFO reports. Um, and he said, this is, it's almost up to the minute. He just got one a little while ago, which uh, turned out to be a drone, or they claim to be a drone. Let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, just before that, he told me he got one from uh, uh, 2018 which was over uh, Northwest Territories by an uh, uh, airline that uh, had a, a, a low uh, UFO going Mach 4, um, and that's, a, that's about a year old. But he's turning all his material over to uh, Mon- Manitoba. So this is, uh, I think, this is a really interesting thing because he's been getting material from the uh, government for years and what else is new i hopefully will be able to get, to, get this some shit. of this of course the australians have more or less opened their files and the brits have opened their files uh uh the americans uh as far as freedom of information we're at uh, we're about number 10 in uh, in the uh in that uh, arena What's going on? i don't even know what the hell it is <laughs> All right, uh, thanks. I th- appreciate it, Jan. Now that case with the uh, the the Mach Four, that's about three thousand miles an hour. That's uh, uh, not too many uh, airplanes can go at that kind of speed. No, no, uh, that, no, that one gets my attention tic-tac. at least. Uh, yes, it's not tic tac uh, uh, speed, but it's pretty uh, it's pretty good. Of course, I was talking to some of these people that that are interested in it. You know, they're trying to. Oh, well, so what? Mach 4. Look at this. Mach 30 with uh, Tic Tac. Listen, uh, anything like this, it's, it's, it's way out of the uh, uh, normal arena of things, and I think this is a, would be a significant case. Now, it's only a, a service case, so it's not detailed. Um, it's just one of those, you know, the old Janip 146 things where you know the just the bare amount of information is is uh, uh put forward but um i i i feel i feel that this the, the government up there finally letting go of this stuff and chris being able to put it in the uh in the university is great Oh, okay. Thank you very much for can that. I, can I can I just can I just jump in there? Go um, ahead, Paul. Thank you. This is Paul Dean. Hi, Jan. How are you? Um, yeah, Jan's absolutely spot on. I love working Paul, with Jan. Paul, by the way, you're a little bit loud. Just so you know, your volume's very loud. Okay. Well, I don't know how to turn down that. You, um, you're, that's you're, you're fine. You're okay. fine. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, Jan. Up. Jan was um, yeah. So 
Uh, Jan was just saying um, something pretty important is that, um, yeah, indeed, Chris Rakowski is, well, Chris Chris is, their, Chris is their civilian. I mean, he's pushed and pushed and pushed the Department of Transport and the Royal Canadian Air Force and um, Canada's, uh, Canada's half of the North American Aerospace Defence Command out of Winnipeg, uh, sorry, out of uh, Sudbury um, for uh, essentially like basic UFO cases. And I mean, it, 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 so Chris, Chris gets copies of what Jan just mentioned, which are uh, service reports. Service stands for um, communications. Uh, yeah, it's communications instructions for reporting vital intelligence sightings, which is a system. It's a radio call-in system. It actually dates back to 1953, and um, it, it used to be placed within a, a, a huge publication that was jointly published by the Canadian government and the um, and the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's it called a uh, joint. Army Air Force Navy uh, Protocol 146. Um, anyway, so so the so a pilot can call in a service report, and um, and indeed a, a pilot did call in. Uh, uh, the, it was par- I don't know if it was a pilot that called it in, but it was it was from officialdom where there was a Mac four object going across Canada, which, like Jan says, is is absolutely incredible. I mean, you take say 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 in the uh, 70s and 80s, the um, Soviet Union's fastest combat jet went at two point Two, uh, sorry, went at um, 2.8 Mach, and if it went any faster, it blew its engines up. Um, you know, something like an F-15 Eagle E model can go at like 2.2. So, so Mach 4 is... Uh, is uh, just to give uh, the, the folks SR-71 another idea... one was Mach 3 plus. Yeah. Yeah, uh, now, the, the SR-71 could hit roughly uh, Mach 3. Max, just to give yeah, some folks an idea, very famous in race trials, and it shouldn't do it. It just should not do that. Blow its engines up. So Mac Four or anything even like Mac Four, just to be like unannounced, just to be leisurely flying across, you know, the Canadian wilderness. So everyone to see, right? Like Christmas tree is is really really crazy. Like that. The, and the other thing is about Chris Rakowski. I talk to Chris Rakowski a lot, and he, you've got to understand that internally, where NORAD's internal radars, like NORAD's NORAD's uh, NORAD. Uh, sorry. Canada's role in NORAD starts off with uh, what we call the first Air Division Canada, which is which is their first fighter combat surveillance unit, and it's dotted all over the country. Chris doesn't get Chris doesn't get um, like up to date minute by minute radar trackings of, of unknown tracks and NORAD remaining unknown targets. They're all classified. What Chris gets is sort of like is 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 is, is non internal stuff. So 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 reports delivered to the um, to the meteorics office, to the National Defence Council people, um, Department of Transport, um, you know, Royal Canadian Air Force Office of Public Information, that sort of thing. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much, Paul, for that input. Uh, Frank, I would like to bring in Dr. Irina Scott. She's an author of uh, many different kinds of novels. Uh, One, uh, I think, is on Ohio history. The other is on um, are on the UFO topic. And um, Dr. Irina Scott, we covered a couple of topics on the show today. And uh, those topics cover Dr. Michu Kaku's input on the UFO topic at the Third International UFO Congress in uh, Barcelona, Spain. And the other one was uh, President Trump chiming in a little bit on the UFO topic. And the UFO topic was in mainstream news a little bit this year. Can you chime in on any of those topics? And you might have your mic on mute just to let you know. You might want to keep it, take it off mute. Is it off now? Yep, it is. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, doctor. I watched the Trump interview several times, and I was pretty amazed because they didn't instantly ridicule the subject. And I thought that was coming along quite well (laughs) compared to the way they had been. Um, So I think things are progressing not real fast, but I was pretty amazed by that. I wanted to uh, ask you about the Michu Kaku a statement that I read. I don't know if you had the opportunity to uh, hear it, uh, but I wanted to know how do you feel about a scientist that credible coming forward uh, uh, about the UFO topic and actually asking the government to, uh, it's basically what what he was saying is the burden of proof is on the government regarding the UFO topic. He placed it squarely on the shoulders of the USO, a UF, U.S. government regarding the UFO topic. What is your perspective on that? I think he's right and he's logical, but I don't know if it'll be perceived that way because uh, there are a lot of observations and good observations. And for example, 
the Nimitz and everything, which had radar and everything else. And so, it in a way it is, but I don't know if the public in general see it that way. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much for that input. I did want to kind of go over year 2019 regarding what happened. And uh, um, I'm getting this from an article, a wonderful one written uh, by an individual by the name of Katie Haney on thecut.com. And she covered January to March. She said in April, um, um, actually, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and start off with, with April. The Navy announces new UFO reporting process. In May, the Times publishes a story on Navy pilots' UFO encounters. In June, lawmakers briefed on UFO report. July, teens hatch plan to storm Area 51. Michael Hall might want to chime in on that topic. In August, we had Bernie Sanders pledge to reveal UFO evidence if elected. September, Storm Area 51 event was canceled. And two YouTubers are arrested for break, breaking in, trying to break in anyway. October, strange organ calculations reported, possible alien ties. I wanted to talk about the actual, uh, it was a very uh, interesting um, cultural uh, related topic, and that is the Storm Area 51 topic. And Michael Hall, I would like to ask you if you could please chime in on that topic. And everybody, please, all of our po- panelists, please remain on audio, not video. Please go to audio. And uh, Michael Hall, uh, you actually uh, had your own event that you wanted to share with the entire world on the Storm Area 51 topic. Can you please share what you did on that the day of Storm Area 51? Well, sure, Chan. Um, you know, it was uh, quite uh, an amazing event. The whole idea that uh, literally, um, due to a, a, a freak incident on Facebook where uh, Maddie Roberts uh, put up a meme that said, let's store Air, storm Area 51 because they can't stop all of us, uh, went totally viral. This was a, a unique year in ufology where, in reality, um, people from around the world got focused on the idea that... Uh, There's something going on about this UFO thing, and maybe it's centered around Area 51 in the Nevada desert. So um, what I ended up doing is I ended up going to the Little Alien and podcasting for five days uh, live. (laughs) Wow. I was interviewed and interviewing uh, Al Jazeera, the New York Times, uh, London Times. Uh, People from around the world showed up there. Uh, not the, uh, you know, millions of people that were, uh, you know, uh, wondering if they're going to show up. But uh, literally there was thousands of people that showed up at the doorstep of this small little community that have 54 people that live there year round. So all I can say about the storming Area 51 event is that it seemed to catalyze uh, the world's interest almost like the Woodstock thing did in 1969, you know, uh, regarding uh, the uh, the war and protests and those kinds of things. Just the fact that you can get a half a million young people in 1969 to go there and have a peaceful weekend of music. It was a very similar uh, feeling at Area 51 at Alien Stock, where literally the world was there. And I'll tell you what, the foreign press were interviewing each other. This is probably the first time that people from around the world could talk with other people from different countries that are interested in this um, journalistic uh, venture of finding out what happened about UFOs. Now, Michael, I would like to put you on the spot regarding this topic. I myself didn't find any educational value whatsoever about anyone uh, uh, possibly thinking about storming Area 51. I know everybody has their own uh, perspectives regarding it, but my personal perspective was I really uh, had an issue with the thought of uh, citizens, uh, whether they be U.S. citizens or anyone from around the world, coming to Area 51, a top-secret base, and actually even thinking of breaking into the base. Now, a lot of people can say, ah, no, it wasn't Maddie Roberts' idea to have uh, or, or uh, emphasize or uh, encourage folks to break into that base. However, I would like to let everybody know 
there were a lot of people that took it literally. And uh, so I want to know, uh, Michael, how do you feel about the idea of people wanting to break into a U.S. military base, one of 800 around the world that we have regarding this topic or just doing it at all? What is your thought process on that? Yeah, well, right from the very beginning, I was discouraging anyone from, uh, you know, breaking any laws, uh, putting anyone in danger, let alone our military assets uh, and personnel. So uh, we came up with uh, the whole idea of uh, an alternative uh, event called Disclosure Aid, where we were just going to basically bring the attention of the world to the uh, disclosure of UFOs and potential ET presence on the planet. Um, but I'll tell you what happened at the back gate on Friday morning at 3 a.m. In the, on uh, September 21st, no, I'm sorry, the 20th, was when everyone was supposed to show up at the back gate and do that storming event. It didn't happen, but there was about 100 people, literally, from around the world that showed up, and not just young folks. There were older people. There were press there and people that were journalists there. And literally, it turned out to be a very positive public relations thing for the uh, military because the Camel dudes were taking selfies with everyone. Uh, there was a very uh, f a feeling of camaraderie, and it kind of kicked off the entire weekend events that happened after that. So uh, we all discouraged anybody from doing anything nefarious out there, for sure. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because I know you did. You made it very, very clear to everybody to not do that. And in fact, that was really part of the essence of why you had the show you did. So thank you for having helped out in that regard. I did want to ask. Oh yeah. Jim let me, let me just jump in. Uh, let me just jump in real quick. And uh, uh, Michael, it started out going in one direction, but it, it evolved into something else and evolved into something better. You got it, Frank. Uh, that was, uh, you know, most of the ufology community was going, I, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm going to stay away from that thing. Uh, but I'll tell you what, as the thing unfolded, and as more and more people sh uh, showed up, matter of fact, the event in Heiko shut down early. So all of a sudden there was nothing left but Rachel, Nevada and, uh, you know, alien stock. Uh, it ended up being a very positive event. And I'll tell you what, Connie West is really looking forward to next year. It's going to be a massive <laughs> event that I think is going to really turn uh, the world, uh, you know, as far as their uh, reality of what's going on. She's going to have uh to expand that place. It's kind of a oh, tiny yeah. place, isn't it? Oh, no. There is plenty of room out is there. there. You won't believe it. Oh, no. Yeah. No, sure. I mean, in the inn itself, it's kind of a tall, uh, kind of a small place, isn't it? Well, literally, the inn itself was closed down for most of the weekend and only opened up for breakfast. So you're <laughs> right. She, she is going to have to prepare for something if she wants to uh, have those breakfasts again at the Little Alien. <laughs> um, I... I uh, was just uh, talking to Stacy off uh, off the show here. I uh, wanted to ask Stacy Wright and Jim Mann about the storm area fifty one topic and how uh, I'd like to give them an example of some things I saw. I was very disappointed to see very violent related commentary. People who were actually planning online to break into area fifty one base openly. And it was not joking either. They were actually planning it. And when I say they, I mean, I saw dozens of statements like that online on social media. I wanted to know, uh, Jim and Stacy, uh, what was your perspective when you heard about this Area 51, uh, storm, uh, storm Area 51 topic and how it was presented? Well, when I first heard about it, I thought, wow, I would really like to see them try this. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's ludicrous. They would think about doing this because their, their question was, you know, can they get us all or, or they, can't, they can't get us all. And I'm thinking, have you ever seen an Apache helicopter in action? Of course they can get you all in a myriad of ways. So, you know, we've got Apaches flying around the Mesa, Arizona area here all the time because they build them right here at Boeing. Um, yeah, they're kind of scary. And a lot of that military aircraft and force is scary. So it was a crazy notion to begin with. I see how it got out of control the way that it did. And I'm glad that it just ended up being a nice, peaceful gathering. Um, 
but yeah, when I first heard about it, I just thought this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. I'm not surprised that um, it kind of got out of hand on social media. Look, I'm not a big fan of social media to begin with. Okay. Um, I think that many times on Facebook, you see a, a sort of a mob mentality. It has nothing to do with the truth. It's pretty deep. That's these keyboard warriors, people that are, are uh, you know, they're, they're, they're heroes and they're very brave as long as they're behind their keyboard and their, their monitors. But you uh, take them out into the real world and things change a lot. So when I read a few things about what they thought they were going to do, <laughs> Area 51, I, just, I had to laugh. You know, because I just knew that that wasn't going to happen. Um, you're talking about a, 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 a secured military base belongs to, belonging to the most powerful um, military in the entire world right now. Do you think you're going to go out there with a handful of people, even if you went out there with 20,000 people, okay, which that wasn't going to happen. We knew it, but um, you weren't going to win. You just weren't going to win. And um, that was just crazy. And I, I, I knew it wouldn't. I knew that it wasn't going to turn into that. Thank and you for that good, input. Yeah, it's good to hear that it did turn into something positive. I didn't attend it. I had no intention of going out there. But I'm glad that it turned into something positive. But what it did do is I think it got a lot of people's attention about how fed up we all are with uh, with secret with secrets. You no. Know? The government, uh, the military, everything belongs to the people of this country. We deserve to hear the truth. Is sometimes as harsh as that truth is. Truth is better than lies. We all know it. Uh, so that's the fight. We're, we're, we're fighting against truth and, and lies. And um, what we can do is keep focused on science, keep focused on reality, keep focused on people. MUFON, and I speak for, for MUFON, we help people see what they, uh, you know, determine what they saw in the night sky. That's what we do. We're, we're, uh, we're organized for field investigations. And, uh, right. And you're right. And we that, are going to have a MUFON boot camp special regarding what Jim Mann just mentioned there. That'll be next Sunday at uh, noon Arizona time. And Frank will also give the uh, uh, other time zone regarding that so people aren't confused. I wanted to ask... Russell Asbill and also Shane Hurd of Phoenix MUFON, what their thoughts are on this storm area 51 topic. I know Stacy had a really great point when she said uh, that she just could not even uh, fathom or imagine why anybody would want to think about breaking on into a, a U.S. military base, especially with the kind of military ready capacity we have. What are your thoughts on that, Russell or Shane? Be sure to unmute your mics and let us know who you are. Yeah, this is Russell. And from the time I I heard about it, I just thought it was stupid. Uh, That, to me, would be a good way to get killed and accomplish absolutely nothing other than that. The military obviously will not let anyone um, get anywhere into the base. it's one of the most highly guarded places that I know of in this country. I just thought it was foolish from the start. I had no intention of going down there, and I'm just glad that it uh, it ended as peacefully as it did, because I think the government wisely had different levels of escalation depending on, you know, what, what, what how many people showed up and their actions. But it, it was just foolish, just from the start. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know what's in there. Uh, to a degree, I think our government should have some secrets uh, uh, on certain items that protect the country, not necessarily UFOs or uh, uh, objects not from this planet. But uh, apart from that, I just thought the the whole uh, storm area fifty one was just full of issues. And, and uh, we've got Shane, Steve. Uh, we've Shane's got Steve Bassett on. Uh, we got uh, Steve. Uh, uh, Steve, if you can unmute your mic, it looks like you're on the call. 
Got a couple of quick questions for you. There you go, yeah, Steve. How are you? Uh, yeah, I just uh, we're uh, obviously going over everything that happened uh, back in 2019, and uh, just real quick, uh, asking you, uh, you know, what was the the thing that stood out for you about the year of 2019 and UFOs? Uh, the, th the thing that stands out is the same thing as last year and the year before. It's the the development surrounding the To the Stars Academy. Um, they've dominated the media. There's been about 600 articles that I've logged in on my website uh, on this issue by the mainstream press. That's a lot. It's a decent amount. Sure it is. Uh, and there's been a number of interviews on uh, talk shows, high-end talk shows. Tucker Carlson can barely go a week without having Nick Pope on talk about what was going on. <laughs> um, but the two of the Stars Academy is the, the, big, the, the big game in town. Some of the most important things regarding them was, of course, early in the year, you had the Identified series. That was significant. Um, and then probably the most important thing was not well known, and that is that they, they were going up on the Hill and, and having meetings with members of Congress privately. We know of a few, but I'm sure they had more than just those few. And I'm pretty sure the game is simple. They're laying the groundwork for hearings. Now, that's a big deal, but it's private. It's in the background. There's only a few articles were written about it. Um, so, and there's been other developments in terms of witnesses coming forward with respect to the Nimitz case and so forth. But they, they have, they, they are the, they're the new story this year just as they were last year. Um, and, and regarding the other gentleman's query, the, the guest uh, caller had a query, is, is if things slow down, is there a season uh, for this? Uh, yeah, there is. There's the impeachment season and there's non-impeachment season. Essentially, we have been in impeachment season for most of this year. And now we're formally in it now. And you simply can't advance this subject uh, under those circumstances. You cannot get the media attention. You sure not can get the political attention, political uh, class attention, unless you're talking about some meetings privately. And you've got witnesses like the Nimitz witnesses, and you've got some gravitas. You can have some private meetings, but publicly, this is going nowhere. So they have slowed down. They're slow walking this intentionally. And I'm slow walking. Uh, I've held off on the podcast. It'll launch pretty soon. But I wasn't going to launch the podcast into this political storm. So, yeah, in a way, things have slowed down. But still, it's been a significant year. A lot has happened. Um, in terms of uh, the storm, Mary 51, hey, uh, that was big news. No question. It was probably the most popular event of this year and one of the most covered. It was never intended to actually be a storm of Mary 51. It was just a joke, as most people know. Uh, he had no idea what was going to happen. He didn't have. He had no idea he was tapping into a massive viral vein. Uh, but a lot of people in this field, high-end people such as myself and others, quickly pointed out this was a bad idea to minimize the number of people who got on board and then decided it was a good idea. And ultimately, it all worked out. Uh, and so while it was very little educational value, there was a lot of activist value. The most important value was the number of people that signed up with interest or willing to go, meaning just signing up. That, that, that's simply there. That's like a petition. They're saying, hey, I'm with you. Uh, and it was nearly, I think, over three million. I know that got the uh, government's attention and I think it got the media's attention. Now, if he had worked that out, so everybody that signed up for, for Storm in Area 51 left their email, uh -huh. uh, that fellow would have one of the most important email lists in the, in the planet right now, but he didn't do. He didn't set it up that way. Uh, uh, but people handle it well. The ones that went out to the gate went out for fun. They had costumes. The guards were hanging out with them. It was great. That's you know they're not the enemy. Area Fifty One and the people there are not the enemy. We're not we're not assaulting the barricades here. But we sent a message. They tried to get some entertainment events going in Rico and Racial. Uh, they were somewhat successful, but I know a lot of money was lost. Overall, though, uh, it shows that if you've got the right hook, if you've got the something that really connects with people in this country, you can go out and get two, three million people maybe signed up only in this case for with emails uh, that you can then draw upon for the activism. So for me, that was a big deal. Uh, so that that's that's my thoughts on some of the things that happened this year. 
I had asked uh, Shane Hurd to give his input regarding the Storm Area 51 topic. I wanted to mention something important Stacy Wright did talk about, which I already mentioned previously, and that is it's... Uh, a, she found it interesting that people would still imagine even breaking into a top secret military base with the kind of military ready capacity that we have. What are your thoughts on all of that and more regarding that topic, Shane? Yeah, at the time um, when that was occurring, I was kind of advocating on Facebook, uh, just a quick short little phrase. It'd be stay home, stay free and stay alive. <laughs> because, uh, you know, approaching a military base of any sort, especially Area 51, would not be wise. Um, I am glad to see that ultimately it ended up with some positive things um, like uh, Michael's work and and, and others. Um, although I kind of was disappointed in that, it you know, we were fighting for such credibility. And I think with TTSA and Unidentified, we were really on a roll there you know, in the month of May, for example, and and the whole topic of UFOs was really getting some credibility. And then that thing happened and it, you know, I, I think it kind of damaged the credibility in that way. But um, as Steve just mentioned, you know, there's still good that come from it. And it certainly, you know, tapped something in the psyche of, of our country um, where millions of people really have an interest in this topic. And so I'm sure that did catch the attention of a lot of people be it mainstream media, politicians, the military itself, and, you know, many of us in ufology. So, I, you know, sort of a two-edged sword. It, it was good, and it was, you know, like Hollywood says, there's no bad advertisement, right? But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so the intention is great on the topic, but, it, you know, to me it was a little bit uh, negative in that it was, you know, lacks some credibility. But, you know, we've taken those hits before, and this topic doesn't die, so... Um, you know, we just keep moving forward, and I, I really do expect to hear some really good things in the near future, especially with those congressional hearings, and, and again, things that will add credibility to the topic. Well, we you had have, mentioned, uh, Shane, um, uh, you had mentioned the Unidentified show, and uh, I think, it, uh, well, I know I was uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, I go into these, uh, you know, more than a, a little bit skeptical as to whether or not the show is going to deliver, and I thought that it did, and we've got a season two coming up next year, and uh, uh, what the, uh, I know we've uh, talked about uh, the Unidentified show quite a bit here, uh, did some reviews on it and all. But does anyone uh, want to jump in and uh, give their thoughts on uh, the season one that we've already seen and uh, what might be coming up in season two? Anyone? Zen. <laughs> well, go ahead. I'd love to give you my opinion. Yep, but I definitely. have to admit, um, I hadn't watched the season. Um, and I don't know why... You know, I just wasn't, um, and not to the fault of anyone or anything. Uh, maybe it's the longevity that I've had um, in the the field. Was I wasn't sure that anything of import was going to be given. That um, I think there was. I, I do. I think there was. I highly well, recommend I mean, the for show. Me yeah. Specifically, yeah. Frank, yeah. because I, I realized that there's a lot of information that most, if not everyone, uh, in the general public aren't aware of. So I'm sure that any kind of, of um, dispersal of information in, in all the different ways that are necessary and, and available is important. And this is one of those things, especially through the television medium, that people were readily accessible to get this new information, and which is new to them. But, you know, as you and I both know, and, and especially, you know, Steve, has been around for a while, and I'm sure that many others uh, realize that most of this that's coming out now, we've been aware of for decades. Um, 
Yeah, they, they still had uh, some nice little finds. They had the lady pilot on in silhouette, uh, which was uh, something that I was not expecting. Uh, they had uh, the two pilots, uh, Graves and a coin uh, from the Roosevelt case. They, uh, mm -hmm. Elizondo kind of uh, took a little cheap shot at Rick Doty, uh, saying that he's not Rick Doty uh, for <laughs> six hours worth. I, I mean, I thought it was pretty interesting. I really did. Uh, there was some, there sure. was some stuff in there that was uh, well worth a look. Uh, anybody else have some thoughts on the show and uh, what we could look forward to uh, with their next season? I can comment. Sure, absolutely, Steve. First, I don't think it's an accident that the next season doesn't start till January. I think mean, they've deliberately uh, pushed it forward, hoping that they'll get we'll get to calm waters, and maybe we'll be in calmer calmer waters uh, by January, uh, and most of this political storm will have passed. We'll see. The next show is going to be the next series is going to be very important. They they did some pretty good things in the first series. They got a little off the rails toward the end. They had plenty of time to think about that. And so I'm going to be watching very closely, one, how much of the threat aspect of this, uh, potential threat aspect of this issue is going to be emphasized in the next series. Um, and that will be something critical. And, of course, are they going to release anything truly new, like more gun camera footage, which they e easily could do. But they're going to have a strong viewership, just as the second season of uh, Project Blue Book is going to have a strong viewership. Because we're winning. Uh, I know some people are having trouble <laughs> accepting that, <laughs> but we are winning in terms of the disclosure process and the disclosure movement. And uh, it's only a matter of time. Uh, but right now, until we can see beyond this, this political storm, and I mean, it's, it's the biggest constitutional crisis in American history. Nothing even comes close, not even Nixon. And so until this resolves and things settle down, uh, don't expect any spectacular developments. But behind the scenes, they're meeting and they will probably continue to do that. On this issue, the first time since 1968. And it's cold. And some of the witnesses we know are available get in front of those uh, committees. Things can move very, very fast. Thank you very much for that input, Steve. I wanted to kind of backtrack a little bit because there are a few people who didn't get to chime in on the Storm Area uh, 51 topic. And uh, one of, well, there are uh, a few uh, that we have left on the list. One I wanted to ask was Paul Dean. And uh, that is what was your uh, perception of the Storm Area 51 topic? Thank you. Oh, well, I mean, it suffers from the same thing as the that most things in ufology suffer from. Uh, it's it's a massive the, the 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 absolute key to the to the to the UFO topic, right? For me, is is the is the detection and tracking capability of like the North American Aerospace Defense Command and the FAA's Joint Surveillance System and twenty first space uh, the twenty first space operations groups. Um, uh, low Earth or uh, low Earth um, surveillance systems and so on. So distractions like Storm Area Fifty One, uh, they they're interesting culturally, but they but they do they certainly do nothing for the topic as far as hard science goes and convincing scientists and technical people that there might be something worth looking into. But aside from that, is while everyone was pontificating about what might happen if you storm Area Fifty One and what could happen if you storm Area Fifty One or whatever, um, as soon as it um, as soon as it was announced, what I d actually did was I sent freedom of, I sent six freedom of information requests. Um, for information about how it would be handled, and they're being processed now. So, um, one was to the um, De deputy chief of staff for uh, installations, logistics, and force protection. Um, another FOI request was to um, to the director of uh, the U.S. Air Force. Uh, I sh sorry, before I should have said it, that's the U.S. Air Force deputy chief of staff for installations, logistics, force protection. The other one was to the um, U.S. Air Force's um, important director for studies and analysis, assessments and lessons learned. Um, and then the other three were to the uh, security police detachment and the disaster. 
Reconnaissance Units of Area 51, Edwards Air Force Base Detachment 3, Air Technical Development Centre. But anyway, um, so what would have happened is, I mean, I, without the without the doctrine and the in the, and the published manuals and the and what we call memorandums of understanding and the actual on base tour orders of what would have happened, I haven't got them yet, and you know maybe I never will. Maybe they'll be classified and redacted, completely blacked out. I don't know. But what would have actually happened is is you, you got to understand that Area 51 has different layers of defence. Um, so there is uh, so there is various um, uh, 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 like automated systems, like uh, cameras and 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 sniffers and and dogs and so motion on. Motion detectors, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, motion detectors, and there's some on on some of the important old roads that have been tried and tested before by um, by people trying to get in. There's, there's there's laser detectors which work only at night and so on. But once you get quite close, there's various units. There's two detachments of the United States Air Force, uh, yeah, the United States Air Force's Security Police, which are fairly basic units. They protect the uh, the flight lines, like the edge of runways. They they uh, have the power to search people for weaponry and bullets and so on. Um, then you've got well, there's obviously the private. The, the private firms like uh, the old E, 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 e and G types, um, but importantly, there's something called a, a disaster preparedness unit, and this would be cons considered as a disaster, just like any any other disaster, say like a mass a mass fuel leak or an ongoing electrical outage or a um, like say the, the the crash of a significant aircraft platform into a um, into an important installation or something like this, but. The, the fact of the matter is if, if, if people got out there, they're going to be hungry and, and I mean, the Air Force are – I mean, you're going to them, right? The Air Force are going to be relying on people to be hungry and thirsty and uh, disorientated, possibly the middle of the night. Um, obtaining extra security forces from places like White Sands and Tonopah Test Range and, and, and whatever would, would not be overly hard. Like, like it, it depends on the numbers. But but one day we might find out. What I'm what I'm curious to learn is is if if any if any internal studies were done by um, headquarters uh, Air Force Logistics or maybe uh, headquarters Edwards Air Force Base Detachment Three or whatever. If any like lessons learned studies were done um, or are being done now. Now onto theoretically what they would have done, and uh, you know because there's every chance it could happen again, and next time it might actually really happen. So, so the thing is, you know, protests have always been a problem in England. The in in England in the 80s, there were so many protesters out nucle outside nuclear sites that the Parliament had to develop thousands and thousands of pages of, of battle doctrine and 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 incarceration doctrine over how to handle it, and um and they actually had to put it into effect. So maybe one day it will happen, and those lessons learned, which I'm hoping to get copies of if they exist, will tell us um tell us precisely what was going through the Air Force's heads at the at the time. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Okay, thank you very much for that input. Steve Hudgens, Director of Investigations of MUFON, wanted to ask you about the uh, Storm Area 51 topic. And I did want to mention, if anybody wants to find out about breaking into U.S. military bases and that topic in general, uh, all you have to do is go to taskandpurpose.com and you will see a great article on multiple attempts by many people who have tried to break into U.S. military bases, some successfully, some not. And the website is taskandpurpose.com. Steve, I wanted to ask you, what was your thoughts? Uh, what were your thoughts on the Storm Area 51 topic? And when I first heard about it, I thought it was kind of uh, funny at first, and then as it started to gradually gain speed, I said, oh, boy, they're going to be in for a big surprise when they get there. And uh, my biggest concern was uh, once they all get there, how they're going to get enough gasoline to get back out because it's pretty limited over there. When you, But my biggest concern is uh, what's going to happen next year because all of the ones that are thinking like me, like, oh, it's a waste of time, it's stupid and all this kind of – well, they're going to go just to go. It's like the new Woodstock. So next year is going to be uh, going to be funny, and uh, the people there at Roswell, they're they'll be prepared for it, and uh, they're going to be rich before it's over with. <laughs> okay, uh, well, there's a few people left. I wanted to ask about this topic, but I'd also like to bring up something very interesting that happened uh, regarding this topic uh, a little bit, uh, and that is there was a lawsuit by I think five to six different people regarding uh, environmental hazards that they believe are environmental crimes 
related to Area 51. They were contractors that worked there, and they got very ill, and they brought a lawsuit against the U.S. government regarding that. If anybody wants to see that interesting article that is in the Washington Post, uh, just look up Washington Post and type in Area 51 lawsuits, Washington Post article. And uh, Bill Clinton, under presidential determination, decided he needs to renew annually a decree that he created, I believe, a potential evidence related to any kinds of these cases that uh, they are all considered classified top secret matter of national security and that it is in the paramount interest of the U.S. that none of any of these lawsuits regarding the materials uh, and what they're alleging happened to them that would that made them sick, one person died, to actually uh, be revealed, that none of it should be disclosed. Anyway, wanted to ask uh, anybody left we have on the panel who have not touched on this topic, I think Dr. Irena Scott has not had the opportunity. What was your thought process on the Storm Area 51 topic? Uh, Dr. Irena, I think you have your uh, mic muted, just so you know. I already missed my opportunity because I lived in Nevada right after I got married. My husband had worked for Area 51, and he could have showed me around and answered questions and things. <laughs> and I couldn't get on base because I didn't have a clearance and he was no longer working there. But I could have found out a lot. And I didn't have a particle of interest. <laughs> so I guess I missed it. and <laughs> So I didn't feel like going again. But, you know, you, he said that when he worked there that a lot of the workers, he had a high clearance. And if he were in with, you know, experimental airplane or something, that the workers weren't allowed to see the airplanes or even look at them. So there'd probably be a lot of people in Area 51 that basically didn't know too much about it. I guess that's all. I, you know, I. otherwise I just didn't think anybody would actually be storming it. <laughs> right. Yes, understood. And uh, Spiros, although you feel like you are not a member of the UFO community, uh, directly maybe, maybe indirectly, I don't know, you tell us, what was your thought process when you heard, uh, or your opinion rather, on folks who really wanted to storm Area 51 and others who wanted the topic in the news for educational reasons so folks would want to learn more about the UFO topic, what, what were your perspectives on any angle of it? Um, my, my original um, feeling was these are not um, UFO people. They're not, they're not researchers. They're not bona fide researchers. They are members of the public. They are the Star Trek convention goers. They're the uh, because because there's no thought given to to the 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 initiative. We're gonna bot, we're gonna raid somewhere that we're gonna get shot at. It's, it's just not. It's a ridiculous thought. So it couldn't have been a serious a serious movement. But the problem is that one person making a joke. You know, this is how religion starts. You know, you, one person says something ridiculous and a few people follow them. And the next thing you know, there's a cult. And, and it, this is a human race. I'm, I, I just feel that it did no good at all to the subject. Um, the credibility was shot. From, from, you know, how many, how many um, serious researchers were involved in this movement? And I think what, um, what Mr. Hall did was great because he brought it back down to earth. OK, because it could have gone mental. It could have gone completely mad because the people that were were going there were going there for a purpose. It turned out to be a party. But um, are we to believe that everyone went there to have a party? I think everyone went there to storm Area 51. Uh, that was the idea. Um, they didn't think it through and it could have got nasty. And I think it, it turned out it turned out for the better. But um Where's the credibility in the whole thing? Where, where does the credibility? Who's who led it? Not not the UFO community, not not the people that are, not the people on this list, for example, that are on this call right now. There is um, no credit. It was pathetic. Yes, <laughs> absolutely no reason to do that. That was it other called than, game, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I agree absolutely. So so what are we doing? We're giving we're giving uh, airtime to a load of lunatics who who didn't think it through. They thought it was it would be a good idea. Nothing, nothing worse, you know. The area can't take the amount of people that were supposed to go there. Um, 
And like, like somebody's already said, somebody already stated, how are they going to get back? Is there, are there facilities there for those people? And, 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 it's just it's just the whole thing wasn't thought through. Um, I'm glad I'm glad the, the government didn't have to retaliate because if they did have to retaliate, would they be the bad guys? Yes, that's exactly. A, and that's, that's a, a very good question. point. That's a, that's a big question. They're defending the country, the very country these people are questioning. Um, so so yeah, you know, anyone that's been to Roswell knows that you know it, 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 they, a lot of people dining out on this subject. And um, I think there's just another circus. It's just another reason to have a party. But um, hey, we all need we... to have a reason to have a party. Yeah, yeah exactly. Party. Uh, I just I just like to add to uh, what Spiro said. Um, I like my steaks uh, medium. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you I wanted what? to go ahead, Sparrow. Yeah, please. yeah, I'm all I'm all for having a party. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, it, you know, but the the, the subject is a serious subject. You know, if you're asking me to believe that there are aliens and if you're asking me to believe that they're visiting this planet and you're giving me no credibility at all, then th then it is just a bit of fun. And if that's what it is, then we should say so. We should say, you know what, guys, we don't really know what's going on here. It's just a bit of fun. Because well, with uh, any is, product curve or any uh, curve to end from this is Zen, by the way. And, and yes, uh, before you. I continue, I would love to just honor everybody that showed up today and my ability to be with you um you guys have all done some great things in the field and I, I, we all appreciate it um so i'm not sure that we can qualify or even quantify how and, and what people were thinking um and i think what michael did was take a situation that was going to happen and and i I don't believe that people really thought they were going to storm Area 51, bottom line. They're more intelligent than that. But they are available. Everybody was, oh, hey, we've got an opportunity to take a road trip and maybe party and maybe turn this into a ufology burning man or something of that nature as we go forward. I mean, everybody's looking for a place in the desert to party. <laughs> yes, that's so, true. I did want to give some input on that. And Zen, thank you so much for your invaluable input on that topic. Wanted to share a few interesting things that have happened at some U.S. military bases, and I'll be very brief. Uh, Zen brought up a very interesting point that was said kind of ad nauseum, in my opinion, and that was, uh, you know, people aren't really going to break into Area 51. Why would anybody say that? It's it's just metaphorical, metaphorical value is what's being uh, uh, basically promoted. Uh, a few things that have happened. One last year, April 3rd in Colorado, a man drove forward with a minivan loaded with propane tanks uh, into, uh, uh, let's see, a series of bizarre incidents, security incidents in gar in involving a military installations across the United States. He went into a, a military base with that. Another one was uh, February 14th. Uh, there was uh, three men who managed to breach a gate that led to the National Security Agency's main complex in Fort Meade, Maryland. Another was February 22nd, an unidentified man rolled up at the front gate to a naval base Kitsap in Washington State, uh, claiming his SUV and his body were loaded with explosives. February 28th, first responders rushed to Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Virginia after an envelope contained an unknown substance ended up sickening at least 11 personnel with symptoms. Uh, that range from burning sensations to worse. Uh, March 27th, federal law enforcement arrested 43-year-old uh, gentleman on suspicion of sending several suspicious packages to one of the military installations. There's quite a long list of military installation-related uh, uh, incidents where civilians, both inside and from outside this country, uh, trying to cause issues that cause major uh, security uh, alarms to go forward. So that's why some people were worried that there could be some potential issues regarding that topic. Wanted to move on to uh, uh, probably winding down this interview. We want to, uh, I'll ask Frank if there's any other topics he wants to cover. Uh, but the one last thing I wanted to mention about Area 51, I think everybody needs to know is that if you were to really break into that base and have your way and just walk around freely, please know that base is known to possibly have nuclear material. So if you break into that base, you're putting all of us at risk regarding that. 
So anyway, uh, Frank, did you have another topic you wanted to cover so we can go ahead and wind down the interview? Well, yeah, I wanted to double back to the uh, the TTSA show and uh, uh, get some more feedback. Uh, uh, Jen Aldrich, I'm, uh, you've been a critic of TTSA in the past. Uh, uh, just curious to see if you watched the show and what you thought of it. Oh, I'm, I'm not a critic, and I have no problem with uh, uh, people trying to uh, uh, earn some money off of ufology. In fact, we we need to do that. We need... <clears throat> We need to fund our our uh, research somehow. Um, I do have uh, I, I'm I rather sharply disagree with a couple of things that they they've been into, like the uh, Italian uh, um, uh, pr- presentation and supposed meeting there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not a critic. Uh, uh, as such, uh, I, uh, it's, it's hard, it's hard for me to tell, uh, uh, you know, uh, exactly, uh, they've done some good and I think they've, uh, uh, stretched out, uh, uh, what their plan is, uh, to such an extent that we're getting a drip, drip, drip about what they're going to do, uh. They haven't seemed to uh, connect with uh, with uh, ufology, except going to uh, going to conferences and you know trying to uh, give presentations. Uh, um, my criticism would be, if you've got the goods, you don't go to ufologists. They're they're at a at a low level of influence in the uh, society uh they don't have any money and uh quite frankly half of them are crazy <laughs> so uh so, so you should be out at UCLA uh Stanford Yale Harvard uh presenting whatever you have there um i i don't i i, I don't want to uh uh, prejudge their uh, what they have, uh, but I do have some issues. <sighs> okay, and uh, anyone else uh, want to jump in on the, the TTSA show in the year that they had? Sure, this is Earl. Go speaking. for it, Earl. Oh, I'm just hoping that they have more goods this coming season. Since they do have a second season, I'm guessing that they do. Uh, Uh, They do. They they do. It's coming up. uh, uh, Steve said January, so that's not too far away. I hope it's, you know, something comparable to the Tic Tac or, you know, I I would like to, you know, just say that there, there really is no slow season with UFOs. There are always good contemporary ufo cases i mean i i have i closed them myself you know just in 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 california we've had some wonderful cases the last year but i think that uh you know the the, what unidentified and what ttsa has is a platform where they can reach many people and i wish that there were more platforms available for you know sharing contemporary ufo uh reports uh, because there's there's never a lack of good UFO reports. It's just uh, I think where the lack is is a way to get those out to the public. Um, I think back when when MUFON had their old Hainer One show that that was a good platform to get things out, uh, and and there were a lot of contemporary reports that people hadn't heard of before there. Um, but now there's no, you know, there's no Hainer One show and there isn't anything that's really filled that vacuum. And it would be really good if there was, uh, you know, we keep mulling the same few cases and, and great cases, you know, Roswell and Rendlesham and, and, uh, the Chicago O'Hare story, the JL flight in Alaska, et cetera, et cetera. But those same cases just keep on getting mulled over and retold, when there's such an embarrassment of richness, actually, uh, in in the field, there are many, many really, really good reports that are contemporary, that are ongoing as far as the investigations go. Well, and, you did, the, Earl, you did the show with the brothers a, a few months back, and uh, that went well. You came off great. 
And, uh, you know, uh, is that uh, like a one shot deal for those guys or are they going to do more shows or don't you know? Uh, you know, I so far I haven't heard that they uh, have gotten a series yet, but they're being kind of mum about it. But they did say that I was going to be their, you know, go to MUFON guy. But, you know, people say a lot of stuff. I haven't, you know, signed a contract with anybody yet. I mean, I'm doing a presently right now, my uh, state director, Jeff Krauss, and myself are uh, working with an Amazon Prime uh, documentary on the subject. And, and uh, we were bringing up uh, our own cases, contemporary stuff. And so hopefully that'll give us a little platform. But there needs to be something like, you know, I mean, when you have the travel channel, like I offered contemporary cases to that show. And right, they, right. They, they weren't really interested. They, they kind of just wanted me to comment on the Tic Tac, which I was happy to do. It's a good case. Uh, they had one. They actually had one case that was the uh, Golden Knights uh, parachute team, and I recognized it. I said, "Well, I'm not going to be able to. I could debunk this one for you guys on air because I, you know, just go to North Carolina, look at football stadiums, and see where they were, you know, doing their thing at." Yeah, and, what they do sure is that enough, what they they, uh, they jump out of planes. They usually have uh, flares with them as well. Yeah, they they do the night jumps and they they start with a huddle, so it looks like one object, and then they they branch off and they create like a little constellation in the, in the sky over over stadiums and and what have you, and that, that's what it was. We actually did that on camera, but they didn't use the debunk, which I was kind of sad about because I, I told them, well that that's going to give you more credibility. If, right, if right, exactly, the, exactly. The thing isn't a UFO. Uh, the other ones are UFOs, but this one is, um, is certainly not. You know. I do note that they found time for Rick Doty, though, on the show <laughs> yeah, after you were on. I <laughs> so, warned them So about he's, he's your co-star too. now. Yeah, I know. Oh, God. <laughs> well, so far I don't have any guys knocking, you know, in black suits knocking at the door or anything. So, <laughs> okay. But <laughs> before we end the show, I definitely have to mention Chase Kletsky's movie, extraordinary the seating a little bit about it so i just wanted to uh kind of remind frank about that uh is there anybody else that wants to touch on the ttsa topic and how uh 2019 uh according to the author who wrote the cut article katie haney said this 2019 was a year famed ufologist and former blink 182 member tom DeLong was proved right about ufos any uh, uh, any uh, input on that comment there and uh, the TTSA topic in general? Chant, this is Stacy. I have something that I wanted to maybe ask our uh, our panel here today, and and that is the the very last episode of Unidentified. The very ending was Luis Elizondo, and he was being asked by the reporter, "Can the public handle the truth?" And Lou just got this disgusted look on his face and shook his head and stood up and walked off camera. <laughs> so wow. I was a little confused by that myself. And I thought, well, what does he mean by that? that? That's a stupid, stupid question, or he doesn't have the answer, or the answer is obvious. I, I was confused by his actions there. What does everyone else think about that? Great question. Thank you, Stacy. Yeah, I, I kind of barely remember that. Uh, the one that... Uh, so I, I can't really comment too much on it. It sounds like something that they just uh, sort of uh, uh, contrived together. But uh, the one thing that I think was interesting was when Elizondo was at the uh, SCU conference in uh, Alabama at Huntsville. Uh, I guess it was uh, earlier this year, maybe even last year. Or, no, it was earlier this year. He was there and, of course, was asked about the frequency question. How often uh, do these kind of uh, serious cases, uh, cases that uh, uh, make uh, people who look at this very carefully scratch their heads and go, uh, there's no easy explanation for that. And he said he wasn't sure, yet during the show, then he said, well, it's a very sensitive number. So we're getting kind of uh, mixed messages there as far as uh, uh, the actual frequency of truly extraordinary uh, uh, cases that uh, might have a witness sighting as well as uh, some physical backup in the way of remote sensing data like radar. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, uh, just uh, before uh, we let everybody go, uh, get some thoughts on that. Uh, what about this frequency question? Uh, I think uh, most of us are at least... Uh, 
if not reasonably well convinced, then at least open to the idea uh, that some of these UFOs are, in fact, uh, uh, some form of extraterrestrial. And uh, just uh, wanted to know uh, what everyone uh, thinks about the, the frequency question, because if, uh, it can't be happening that much. Uh, uh, and uh, but, it, but it does seem to be happening uh, with some regularity uh, spread out over a long period of time. Uh, anyone have any thoughts on all that? Well, I want to uh, jump in about the, the comment about whether the public is ready for the information. And um, I just want to point out that there's still a very high percentage of the world and the, the United States that still feel that the, the phenomenon goes into the realm of the ridiculous and uh, will ostracize you if you mention the topic. So as a um, conglomerate of UFO uh, enthusiasts, uh, researchers, and authors, what we need to do is to work towards legitimizing this topic. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows A.R. Borden, uh, who recently, well, he passed away a couple years ago. He and, and I and, and uh, a few other people were trying to work to standardize the reporting procedure of the phenomenon and he was working towards getting the topic itself legitimized to the point of being a a topic in universities unfortunately he passed away and and that um effort uh, is mm -hmm. is now lost but we're still not at the point where we can have enough support to to force disclosure or to um to have uh to to, to have it a, a topic where it is uh considered as a respectable topic in in the general public all right and uh, anyone else want to jump in before we wrap up I'd like to make one uh, question. This is Zen again. Um, do we really show a unified front to the public, or is it the um, dichotomous views within ufology that continues to fuel the public's reticence to accept us as real? Well, I, I don't think it's a unified beyond the fact that uh, we're all very much into this subject. Uh, beyond that, everybody kind of goes in their own direction. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's ever going to happen where everybody's going to get on the same page as far as every aspect of the subject. I just don't think it's happening. It uh, will ever happen. It just covers too much ground. There are too many, too many things to disagree about. <laughs> I'd like to ask uh, Spir uh, Spiros Millaris, I'm, I'm going to give you only a few minutes, so uh, forgive me for momming you here and restricting you time-wise, okay. but I'm going to ask you, you've had to deal with an awful lot of uh, uh, input from folks regarding your, your fake film, the Alien Autopsy movie, being real, and then the question that was just posed right now uh, by Zen, do we look like a, a unified force, essentially, regarding the UFO topic, the folks that are involved in the UFO community? You've had to deal with a lot of flack, both in and out of the UFO community, regarding your fake film, and also you have a bird's-eye perspective regarding the UFO community and how they may or may not look unified to you. So if you feel like you can answer that in the shortest way possible, that would be great. Um. Very quickly, I think I think if I wanted to, and if you if you give me the challenge, I'll take it. I can fool you all again, and I think the reason I can do that is because the majority of people viewing want to believe, and whilst that's the case, um, we're never going to get a unity. We're going to get the people that know the facts, like uh, people that have seen data and they can see things that are credible. And they're not they're not delivering that data in a, in a credible way, um, and where they are delivering it, they're delivering it to each other. So they're not delivering it to the public. The public is none the wiser. So um, in order to get the credibility that we seek, um, we need to do it in a blanket way. 
Um, I think if the US government were hiding things in Area 51, they could very, very easily create a reality TV show where they have a number of experts who put up a number of, of elements why this is not real, and the majority of people watching will believe it. And I think that's the bottom line. Um, where's the unequivocal evidence? And, and whilst we haven't got that, um, we're back to the, the belief system. We're just back to religion. So, um, no, I don't think we're ever going to see, we're never going to see the, the level of um, satisfaction that we require. So what can we do? What's the next best thing? Hope for the best. Okay, and also I'd like to mention, uh, we don't have that much time left, just a few minutes, that Spiros Millars will have a 25th anniversary regarding the alien autopsy movie he created 25 years ago, and then also wanted to ask a question of two of our panelists, uh, whether they will agree to do something or not, and then there's three other topics I'm going to mention uh, that we're going to cover in the future. Uh, that way uh, everybody knows, and I'd like to also t thank Frank for something personally on our show. Uh, so I'd like to ask Michael Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer, and Spiros Malaris if they will consider doing a show regarding the topic that was covered very briefly today on our show. Uh, and also, I would like to include a transcript I have never read before uh, regarding questions that Michael Hall very graciously and kindly uh, created for me to ask Commander Willard Scott. Uh, Willard uh, Miller. I sorry, Willard Miller. Sorry Willard, about that. Willard Scott Thank was you. the old uh, weatherman. Yeah, right. That would be amusing if I asked him, right? Those questions. It would be. But uh, Commander Willard Miller, the questions that uh, Michael Hall created for me to ask him, I did ask him, Michael, and I'd like to read those questions to you. The uh, the uh, the answers that he gave to me uh, regarding those questions. Well, and, we did we uh, did that on an earlier the, show. We did that on an earlier yeah, show. But I'd like to know if Michael Hall will join us on a show with Spiros, go over those answers because there are other questions I asked that I did not cover. Uh, will you uh, consider doing that, Michael? Oh, of course. Uh, okay, you know, Spiros is one of the most knowledgeable guys in this subject. He created the film and, uh, you know, I've always just been out there trying to gather information. I would love to do that, uh, Chan. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. So we'll get back to our two panelists on that topic regarding scheduling that show. Thank you very much. Perhaps maybe we can uh, do that, you know, in January of next year. We'll figure it out. The other topics I wanted to mention is uh, uh, Chase's movie. Chase Kletsky created an, a fascinating movie that is getting awards. It's called Extraordinary. The Seating is an award-winning documentary film that highlights the often forgotten Missing Fetus Syndrome. It is now trending and free on Amazon Prime. That she's very happy to let everyone know about that. And uh, she's also emphasizing this is not about the money, uh, which she has not made a penny. It's about everyone having the opportunity and privilege of seeing it. And that she's very happy to let everybody know about that. It was uh, quite an endeavor on her part. And a lot of people uh, were involved on that. The other topic I wanted to bring up is uh, very important. We have a very special show that's happening next Sunday. Frank will have to give everybody, everybody the time on that, you know, what kind of central time that's at. It's at Arizona. Uh, two e two time. Eastern time, as far as I know. 2 p.m. Eastern time. We'll and that it. show is going to be about Phoenix MUFON's boot camp special. Uh, they had a boot camp recently. They had quite a few interesting people who showed up. Mark D'Antonio, the astronomer. They also had John Dover. Everybody knows John Dover. If you don't, please look him up. He's a fascinating person. I had the opportunity and privilege of interviewing him uh, uh, this year. I uh, wanted to let everybody know, please tune in to that show. And then also, I would like to thank Frank, because it has been a year that I have had the privilege and honor of being your co-host it's our one-year anniversary regarding uh, my being your co-host on the show. Roughly, it is. About, about so, that, and, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you started, uh, I think, on the Bob Lazar panel that we had and then uh, did uh, our year-end review show last year <laughs> where we only had four guests, including <laughs> you at that time. Yeah. And today right. we had 26 or 27 <laughs> guests. So the show yeah. was seven or eight times better than it was last year, for sure. So, yes, thank you, Frank, for being no my co-host. And uh, th thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for helping keep it going. Uh, because it's uh, Congratulations, uh, guys. Yeah, yeah. 
I uh, appreciate that, Smaros. Congrats. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not a one man. Uh, it's really not a one man person running one of these things. So uh, definitely, uh, Chance stepped in and uh, did a lot more than You're I was expecting. Team. Really, You're a great team. Well done. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. I mean that. I mean every. Minute, I particularly everyone. was impressed with the amount of preparation that she did, and you too, Frank. Uh, Chant does most of the preparation. Thank I just you. wing it. Yeah. Awesome <laughs> job, guys. Well, thank we, you we very a, much. We Great a, show. We have always my in, favorite. Uh, we have a saying in the UK: uh, Chant is um, is uh, a Rottweiler with lip gloss. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty. That's yeah. about right. That's about right. <laughs> Once you get the teeth into something, that's it. It's not going anywhere. So, yeah, but good. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, anyone else have anything else to add that we didn't get to? Uh, uh, jump in now. No last parting thoughts, huh? I'd like to, I would would like to personally thank Phoenix MUFON director uh, Jim Mann, assistant director Stacy Wright. I would like to thank uh, Russell Asbill uh, and Shane Hurd, uh, investigators for Phoenix MUFON. I would like to thank Earl Gray, uh, uh, who is on, I believe, the star team. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. You're also the assistant director and a former uh, investigator of uh, Southern California uh, MUFON chapter. Still am. All, <laughs> you still are, still but you... You're, you're not just investigator. You're also investigator, the assistant director. Yeah, yeah there Thank we go. You. Chief investigator. And Thank you. And then research team, too. Wonderful. Thank you. And then we also had Ruben Uriate. And uh, uh, Ruben was on the show briefly with us. Earl, can you please share his, his title? Mm -hmm. Sure. Northern... Ruben is the North, uh, North Calif Northern California State Director uh, and a Thank dear you. friend. One, a very knowledgeable guy and a wonderful author as well. Thank you very much for that input. Uh, we also did have a show with uh, Ruben uh, and a few other people. And that show, please look up. That was a fascinating show. We had Dr. Irina Scott, author of multiple UFO books, all published by Philip Mantle of Sky Disc Press. Philip Mantle was supposed to be on with us today, but he didn't have the opportunity. And uh, then we also had Spiros Malaras, owner, creator, and director of the Alien Autopsy movie. The 25th anniversary will be next year. Uh, we had Zen Benefil, uh, who is... Uh, uh, well, actually, Zen has quite a long resume, so you have to look him up. He also uh, runs the, I believe it's the, is it the UFO PRSS? Can you can you tell me the name of that uh, PRSS that you have on Twitter that everybody needs to follow? Ufology underscore PRSS. Okay. It's basically great. the same title as the website, ufologypress.com. And right. we've just hit the 11,700 mark. Congratulations. Thank you. We had, I don't know if um, that's anything or not. <laughs> that is significant. That's something to uh, to drink to. We had Michael Hall, the attorney uh, for Grant Cameron and a few other notable people in the UFO community and outside of it. Uh, uh, and we also had Paul Dean, a uh, historian and researcher uh, uh, on. We had Jan um, Aldrich, Aldrich on. Uh, yes. And uh, Jan, just to share a little bit about Jan, he is, uh, where do we have Jan here? I have a founder and coordinator, coordinator of Project 1947, which is a research project documenting UFO news accounts from sightings that occurred in 1947. Please do look that up so that you can uh, 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 read all of his fascinating information uh, of, great on site. his website. Great site. Go yes, check it out. I've got uh, I've got some links to it at my website from uh, uh, some of the uh, oral histories that they did over there. Just uh, fabulous work. He had mentioned Tom Tooley, and, and uh, he's a guy who uh, got in the faces of some of these folks. And I'm assuming uh, some of them aren't around anymore. So uh, that's uh, that's part of the historical record, and that's great work they do over there. Then we also had um, Steve Bassett, who is a lobbyist in Washington, uh, and we also have. Uh, an activist also. Uh, we had Steve Hudgens, Director of Investigations for MUFON. And uh, uh, if I'm missing anybody, please Paul let Dean. me know. Paul, Paul Dean. Dean. I did mention oh, yeah. Paul Dean is a historian okay. and researcher. Yes. Is there okay. anybody else? Um, uh, Paul Vecchiette. Author Paul Vecchiette joined us late. Okay, great. And then we also had uh, Dave Loomis. He had some, uh, I think he was a state section director for Sholo MUFON. He had some uh, serious audio issues, but we will hopefully be hearing from him 
next Sunday at 2 p.m. Is it Central Time, Frank, for the MUFON uh, Boot Camp uh, Special? It, it is uh, 2 p.m. East Coast Time, uh, okay. 3 p.m. West Coast Time in Arizona. I guess it'll be two, uh, noon. I'm sorry. Right. Wait a minute. Uh, 3 p.m. Uh, it'll be uh, n no, wait, 2 p.m. my time, noon your time, and then 11 a.m. West Coast Time. There we go. Okay, everybody. All right. Thank you very so we're much good. for having been on the show. Yep. Thanks a lot, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of the year and enjoy your holiday season if I don't get to talk to you. Thanks a lot. You too. You Thank too. You thanks a bunch. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.